Hello, everyone. Welcome to Real Astronomy in the Universe of Harry Potter. And my name is John Gianforti, and I'm going to make some real connections between what J.K. Rowling did in her Harry Potter series of books and later in the movies and with the real uh, topic of astronomy. So again, my name is John Gianforti. I'm the director of the University of New Hampshire Observatory here on the Durham campus. Um, I also teach astronomy and physics here at the university, getting ready for the next semester, which starts next week. Okay. So let's, uh, let's get started. Before I, I, I interject um, the Harry Potter universe to you, I thought it might be a good idea to talk about what's visible in the night sky right now. So what I did was I put together a couple of slides just to uh, show you what's visible in the sky right now, because there's lots of neat things visible in the sky. For example, in the morning, before the sun comes up, you can actually see the planet Venus. And um, in the next couple of slides, I'll show you some larger pictures. But if you go outside in the morning and it's clear, and you look to the east, you have to have kind of a good view to the eastern sky, not a, a lot of trees or houses or buildings in the way. You will see a beautiful, brilliant white object that looks like a, looks like a diamond in the sky. And that's the planet Venus. You can also see um, Mars in the late evening sky at, at night, close to 10 or 11 o'clock, again in the eastern sky, and Mars looks like a bright orange star. So both of these two planets, Venus and Mars, are easily visible without a telescope. Then I wanted to tell you about planets that are visible as soon as it gets dark, as soon as the sun sets, even before, in the southern sky, very low, sometimes making them difficult to see, especially if we have trees and buildings around our house, but Jupiter and Saturn are visible, and they are well worth your time going out and seeing if you can find them. So here's a picture of Venus that I took back in the beginning of the summer, um, and it's still low in the eastern sky, and this is the horizon right here. So this is the ground, these are some trees, this is a little layer of fog made the morning really pretty and this is Venus so even though it's getting light outside you can still see this bright white brilliant planet in the sky it's just absolutely breathtaking it doesn't even look like it's real Jupiter although it looks like a star-like object to the unaided eye you know without a telescope if you were to look at Jupiter with a telescope you're we you really would be treated to a beautiful view of a large planet, of course, the largest planet in our solar system. And you could see some cloud features, some, some weather in the Jupiter system. So I took this picture at the University of New Hampshire Observatory back at the end of July, the 31st of July. And you can see some cloud belts here. You can see the great red spot, which is actually bigger than the planet Earth, like three times bigger than our whole planet. But sometimes, Depending on when you look, you can actually see the storm that's been visible in Jupiter's atmosphere for more than 350 years. And then a little bit to the left or to the east of Jupiter in the early evening sky, we have the jewel of the solar system, Saturn. It's the planet with the bright rings on it. So if you look at Jupiter, you'll see a yellowish star-like object and a little bit to its left, you'll see Saturn not so bright and more of a cream or a tan color. So this is a star map showing the positions of Jupiter and Saturn in the constellation, the group of stars known as Sagittarius. Now Sagittarius is the archer, but I like to think of it as the teapot because it looks like a big teapot of stars in the sky. And Jupiter and Saturn are both within the boundaries of Sagittarius. And you can you probably also notice that little Pluto, the dwarf planet, is almost directly between the two gas giant planets. Of course, Pluto's too dim to see without a telescope. In fact, you need a big telescope to even see it. But 
there's three planets visible in the early evening sky. And then this is a more complicated star chart here. But if Jupiter and Saturn are here, Mars is way to the east, way over here. And it's a beautiful orange color, a very, very bright orange star. So I wanted to let you know what you can see in the evening sky and remind everyone that last month, and see if you saw the comet Neowise, which was a very bright comet in our evening sky in the Northwest. Many people wrote into our Facebook, our observatory Facebook page saying that they saw a good view of comet Neowise, which was the brightest comet in, uh, since uh, the, er the late 1990s. So that was a really, really nice sight in our summer sky. So in addition to covering the universe of Harry Potter pertaining to astronomy, I thought I would throw in a little astro history, talking about some famous scientists that helped us understand how the universe really worked and provided the basis, or at least some of the basis, for how we understand our universe today. So as you all know, if you're a Harry Potter fan, that astronomy is a core class subject that taught at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft. And everyone takes it. Astronomy is the branch of magic and science that studies stars and the movements of the planets, just like real astronomers do. It's a subject where the use of practical magic and spells during lessons is not necessary. And I think that's true because J.K. Rowling knew that astronomy in itself provided enough magic for people. They didn't need the wizardry and the magic present in so much of Harry Potter. So let's get started. About 400 years ago, the famous scientist Galileo wrote a book called Sidereus Nuncius, or The Starry Messenger. And it summarized all of his discoveries that he made with a telescope. Now, Galileo didn't invent the telescope. He heard about it from a friend in Venice, Italy. Galileo loved Venice. I think it was the great food. But he learned from a friend that in a toy store in Paris, his friend found an object, a toy, that when looking through it made things look closer. So without ever seeing a telescope, Galileo went to his workshop and he and his students built their own version of the telescope and made improvements. And it, it's basically what a lot of what Galileo is noted for, but he didn't invent the telescope. And all of his observations were summarized in this book called The Starry Messenger. And one of his big discoveries was that he discovered four of the largest moons of Jupiter at a time when all the teachings of the church and of the scientists around Galileo was, were taught that everything orbited the Earth because it was the center of the universe. Of course, today we know that that's, that's not true, but in the 1600s, it was just becoming questioned whether or not the Earth was really the center of the universe or not. So a little bit more on that later. So I like to say that the universe is accessible to almost everybody. All you have to do is look up. And there are a lot of stars for us to study. Like I say, so many stars, so little time. So before we get, in, before we get started, when I make astronomical comparisons and interjections into the Harry Potter universe, I'm gonna talk about distances, how far a particular star is away. So the universe is really big. And if we want to really understand um, the, just how big the universe is, we have to use some big numbers. Astronomers use the light year to describe distances to stars and galaxies out in space. And a light year describes distance, not time. So if we stay, say that a star is one light year away, we mean that it would take a beam of light one year to get from that star to the Earth. So a light year is a big unit of measure. Think of it as a yardstick or a meter stick that astronomers use to measure and describe distances to things in space. And just for the record, a light year is equal to six trillion miles. 
That's a six with 12 zeros after it. That's a lot of miles. So let's get going. I want to share a website with you um, that I thought was really, really interesting that kind of summarized um, a lot of the, or at least some of the references that J.K. Rowling makes in Harry Potter of real astronomy. For example, uh, Alfred, Elf, Elfard Black, Sirius Black's uncle, or Andromeda Tonka, or Bellatrix, the female warrior, or how about the centaurs that are in almost all of the Harry Potter books and movies, a, a creature that is half human, half horse, has a lot of bases in astronomy. Or uh, Cygnus Black is a father of, of Narcissa, Andromeda, and Bellatrix. Cygnus is a constellation. Um, how about Draco Malfoy? A constellation all in itself. So there are a lot, a, a lot of references to Harry Potter that have the basis in real astronomy. Let's continue. Let's talk about some of those. Okay. John, I have a quick question that came in. Okay, go right ahead. Um, is it possible for there to be the end of the Earth? Well, that's a really good question. Um, well, let's imagine if we set out on a nice long nature walk and we walked and we walked and we walked and we walked, we would never actually find the end of the earth. We, we might end up, if we're good navigators, where we started. But since the earth is a sphere, all we would do is walk around the 25,000 miles that represents the circumference of the earth, and we'd end up back where we started. So there's really no end, or for that matter, the beginning of the earth. It's a really good question, though. Thank you. You're welcome. So the first character I wanted to cover is Alfard Black. He's a Slytherin, as you all know. He's Sirius's, uh, Sirius Black's uncle. Now, Alphard has a real important role in real astronomy. It happens to be the brightest star in the constellation of Hydra, the serpent. So in this, this star chart that I have on my astronomy program on my computer, it depicts all the stars that are highlighted in purple. This is the region of the sky that astronomers have set aside for Hydra. And the brightest star, or the alpha star in Hydra, is Alphard. Now, Alphard is the brightest star in Hydra. The Arabic, it's called the solitary one. And it's 180 light years from the sun. So it's really far away. And it's much, much larger than the sun. It's um, about 40 times bigger than the sun is, and it's much more um, luminous than the sun. That is, it puts out a lot more, 780 times more energy than the sun does. So I thought it was, he must be a really prominent character in Harry Potter to gain such a prominent name as Alphard, the, bright, the alpha star in Hydra. Um, Hydra is the largest of all of the constellations. As you can see, this purple patch in the sky is huge. So it's visible in the, in the summer sky. John, may I interject? A absolutely, go right ahead. Okay. Um, is it possible for the Earth's core to crumble and create the end of the world? Um, well, you know, the earth is pretty old. It's very old. And when the earth first formed, it was very hot. In fact, when the earth formed and some of the other planets as well, it was a uh, molten, that is a liquid. And over time, the earth has cooled with time. 
So first, the crust solidified, it hardened, it cooled down, it hardened, and now we're walking a lot around on something that used to be liquid rock because it was hot. And since the Earth formed many billions of years ago, the Earth has got calmer and calmer. So eventually, in the very, very distant future, the entire Earth will solidify. And there won't be any more earthquakes or volcanoes. But the fact that there are earthquakes and there are volcanoes today is a good thing because it tells us that our earth is still alive inside, it is still warm, things are still moving around, and that's really important for living things on earth because the fact that earth has a, a metal core deep inside the earth that's metal and still molten or liquid, and it spins, it turns around, well, the earth spins on its axis once a day, that gives us a powerful magnetic field around the earth that protects us from radiation and cosmic rays from outer space. So the fact that the earth is still somewhat active inside is actually providing protection for all the living things on the earth. So it's very unlikely that anything nasty or bad is going to happen on inside of the earth to make the end of the world take place. Good question. That's something that we don't have to worry about. Wow, that's awesome. I just learned a bunch of new things. I have a couple more questions for you, if you don't mind. Do you want to take them now? Go right ahead. Okay. Because many stars have already died and their light is only now reaching Earth, are any of the Harry Potter constellations partially gone by now, even if they are still visible? Wow, that's a, a very, very good but deep question. <laughs> and so, so that must have come from um, a young astronomer. They would have to know something about the size of the universe to ask a good question like that. And I will tell you that the answer to that question is no, because Harry Potter really isn't that old, is it? It, I, in fact, I don't even know how long ago the first book came out. I wasn't prepared to answer that question. But it's not that old. And the thing about stars that we have to remember is that stars last a long time. Sometimes we catch ourselves saying that stars live long lives. Well, they're not really alive. They're not living things. But they shine, they produce energy, and they're visible for many millions, if not billions of years. Now a billion is a thousand thousands. I'm sorry, a thousand million. And that's a lot. So in the life of Harry Potter, all of the stars that existed in the movie are still around simply because stars last and lead such long existences and they're all still around. But, your question is a valid one and a very good one because stars uh, are, lie at very great distances from the sun. So it's quite possible, it's quite possible that a star that we see in our sky, depending on how far away it is, let, let's say it's 500 light years away. That's much older than the Harry Potter series. But it's possible that in that 500 years, the star has, has gone out of existence. It stopped shining. But that information is still traveling to the Earth because it takes the light 500 years to get to Earth from a star that's 500 light years away. Great question. I have one more that, or two more that are relevant to what you were just talking about. Go ahead. Um, when roughly will Hydra die? Well, Hydra is a constellation. I'll go back one. Hydra is a constellation, and it's composed of many stars. So let me put my glasses back on. So all of these little dots, all of these little dots and the big dots, these are stars that are within the region of the sky that astronomers refer to as Hydra, okay? So 
there are many stars of many different ages of many different types inside of Hydra. Okay. So the star um, Alphard, the brightest star in the constellation, it is um, a cooler star than the sun, okay? I I'm just talking about now one star in this vast constellation in the sky. So it's a, it's a smaller star than the sun, and as far as sun stars are concerned, the smaller the stars are, the longer they live. That seems strange, right? You'd think that big stars that have lots of fuel would last longer. But the trouble with that is that large, massive stars use up their fuel faster than the lower mass, smaller stars. So the star, the brightest star in Hydra, Alphard, um, it's going to last even longer than the sun. And the sun has a lifetime of 10 billion years. 10 thousand million years. So eventually, yes, the stars will run out of fuel and die, but not any time in the near foreseeable future. Great question. John, one more for right now. Sure. Approximately, right. Uh, sorry, approximately how many stars are in the sky? Um, a lot. <laughs> Let's put it this way. On any given night that's clear and when the moon isn't in the sky, because when the moon is in the sky, it hides some of the fainter stars. On any given clear moonless night, we can see about 2,000 stars with the unaided eye, that is the naked eye, without a telescope, without binoculars, okay? But there's really many more than that that are too dim for us to see. So the, the Earth is a planet that orbits a star, and we call that star the Sun, right? And there's seven other planets that orbit our star, the Sun. But the star, the Sun, is a part of a larger group of stars called the Milky Way ga Galaxy. And the Milky Way Galaxy has some half Half a trillion stars, 500 billion individual stars make up our galaxy. And if our eyes were sensitive enough, we could see most of them. But a lot of them, most of them, are too faint for us to see. So it's a hard question to answer because there's billions of hundreds of billions of stars in our own little galaxy that we live in actually it's a big galaxy and the reason we can't see them all is because they're too far away and too dim for us to see great questions you're really making me uh, put on my thinking cap this afternoon okay so i'm going to move on from from uh, alfard and hydra to uh, andromeda tonks another character that you're probably familiar with. Andromeda Tonks has two very famous namesakes in the sky. One of them is the constellation Andromeda. And if you know anything about mythology, Andromeda is the mythological princess. She's the princess that the hero Perseus rescued from the sea monster. And in the night sky, Andromeda shown here, this actual purple shaded region, and this group of stars here, these two little arcs of stars here, this is the princess in the night sky attached to the constellation of Pegasus, the flying horse. So Andromeda Tonks has the constellation as her namesake, but also a very important object that Andromeda contains. And that is the Andromeda galaxy. So there's a galaxy. We were just talking about the Milky Way galaxy. This is our closest large neighboring galaxy called the Andromeda galaxy because it lies within the region of space that we call Andromeda, the princess. And this galaxy is 2.6 million light years 
from our own Milky Way galaxy. And it's huge. It's more than 150,000 light years across. And if this was the Milky Way, our sun would be located uh, way out here, way out here, out here in the suburbs. And all these other stars here, these are foreground stars. These are Milky Way stars that are between us and the Andromeda galaxy. So Andromeda Tonks has the constellation Andromeda, as well as this beautiful galaxy as uh, her namesake. Uh, another uh, astronomy name uh, uh, in, in Harry Potter is Augusta Longbottom, uh, Neville's grandmother, has the name of, a, of the asteroid 254 Augusta. Asteroids are named in the order they're cataloged. So Augusta was the 254th asteroid to be cataloged. And it's a really small one. It's only about seven and a half miles across, and it resides in the main asteroid belt. That's where most of the asteroids in our solar system are found. That's between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. So that's just another name of a relatively insignificant asteroid that uh, J.K. Rowling used for Augusta Longbottom's namesake. Bellatrix Lestrange. Bellatrix Lestrange. That's just got a nice ring to it, I think. So Bellatrix Lestrange, uh, another Slytherin. Um, this, this, she's kind of a shady character, right? She, she's, she's crazy about Voldemort, right? She, right? She's crazy about Voldemort. I, I have to say that. And um, Bellatrix is um, uh, has has a, 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 a origin of the name Bellatrix come from a female warrior, right? So the name fits for sure. And Bellatrix is actually the third brightest star in this very famous constellation of Orion, the mythological hunter. And this is Bellatrix right here, right? This is Bellatrix. And Bellatrix is um, the third brightest star in Orion and the 27th brightest star in the sky. And it's a very, very different star from our sun. It's much, much, much hotter. It's more than three times as hot as the sun. And it's blue in color, which means it's very, very hot. And it's about 9,000 times more luminous than the sun. And it lies at a distance from our sun of about 250 light years. So it's really far away, bigger, more powerful than the sun. So that's why it looks so bright in our sky. So this character has a relatively important or prominent name in astronomy. So I mentioned- John, can I, Sorry, can I insert a question? Of course. Um, how long would it take to reach the Andromeda galaxy? Well, that all depends on how fast you're going. So what do you want to drive there? If you wanted to drive there, um, your calculator couldn't hold all the numbers that it would take. That's how many years it would take. But let's just pretend for a minute. If you were traveling at the speed of light, and if you traveled at the speed of light, you could travel seven times around the world in one second. You could travel to the moon. Um, you could tra travel to the moon uh, um, in about uh, uh, 1.3 seconds. That's really moving fast. So if you were traveling at the speed of light, it would take you 2,600,000 years to travel the distance between our galaxy, the Milky Way, and, and the Andromeda galaxy. But yet, it's the closest large galaxy to the Milky Way. Now, if you're interested in going to the Andromeda galaxy, I've got a solution for you. If you wait 4.3 billion years, the Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy will collide with each other. So 
you don't have to make a trip at all. Just wait out the 4.3 billion years between now and the time when our two galaxies collide. So nothing to worry about now, but a long time from now, we'll be galactic neighbors. Um, who discovered the first constellation? Well, that, I, that's a good question. A, a lot of the original, so right now in the sky, there are 88 constellations. A combination of ancient astronomers, say 5,000 years ago, I don't know the person that did it, but someone in Babylonia, in the Middle East, those people, early observers of the night sky, they put what was important to them in the night sky so that those stories would carry on forever. So this was before books, before the internet, before computers, even before paper. So in order for stories to endure over the generations of time, they put their stories of what was important to them, their mythology, into the night sky where they thought it would last forever. They had no idea that stars have a definite lifetime. They didn't know that. So they put stars, stories in stars and constellations and made up stars into pictures in the sky that related to stories that were important to them. So the first constellations were named by observers in the Middle Eastern part of the world about 5,000 years ago. And there are 88 constellations that are acknowledged today by astronomers all over the world. So we've divided up the entire sky that surrounds the Earth into 88 little regions that we call constellations. And those constellations are usually marked by at least moderately bright stars. So I don't know the person's name because there were many people that put stories and myths and constellation names into the sky, but it was more uh, a progression over time. Okay, you wanna take other questions? Um, how many constellations are in the galaxy? Well, I don't know. I told you there were 88 that we can see from Earth, but of course we're only seeing the very nearest stars in the sun's neighborhood. There are stars well beyond the stars that we can see that make constellations for maybe someone else living on a planet orbiting a distant star. And as of today, we know of more than 4,000 other solar systems out in space, just in our galaxy alone. Who knows? There could be someone living on some of those 4,000, a planet in some of those 4,000 solar systems. They would see completely different constellations than we do. Okay, I'm gonna go on. I mentioned in my intro that there were centaurs uh, in Harry Potter. Then centaurs, of course, are creatures that are uh, half human and half horse. And um, they're, they're kind of strange creatures. Um, they kind of like to be left alone. They, they like being, you know, uh, centaurs. Um, they don't like to participate in the affairs of, of, of people. But the um, namesake, the astronomical companion, if you will, um, of where centaurs come from is, is twofold. First of all, there is a class of, of objects, a type of asteroid that don't orbit in the normal asteroid belt that exists between the orbits of the planet Mars and Jupiter. The centaur asteroids orbit the sun at great distances from the sun, out near the orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. Now, Chiron is the most notable centaur asteroid. And this isn't a picture of Chiron, but it's a picture of what we think a centaur asteroid would look like. And they're kind of weird. They're like comets on the outside, but asteroids on the inside. Now, comets are icy bodies that orbit far from the sun. 
And asteroids, for the most part, are rocky objects that orbit, most of them, closer to the sun. So they're kind of like a combination, like centaurs are. Centaurs are half human, half horse. The centaur asteroids are, well, kind of like a combination of comets and asteroids. And the other namesake of uh, centaurs is the huge constellation called Centaurus. Now, unfortunately, we can't see Centaurus from Earth, from, I'm sorry, from Earth, from New Hampshire. It's too far south. It's a far southern constellation. You have to go to California, Texas, uh, Florida, uh, maybe at southern Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, to catch a glimpse of at least part of Centaurus. But it's a huge constellation. And one of the reasons that I thought it was so interesting is that Centaurus contains its brightest star called Alpha Centauri. Some stars have proper names, and we give stars a nickname in a constellation. We call the brightest star in a constellation, we call it the Alpha Star. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet, right? So Alpha Centauri simply means brightest star in Centaurus. And Alpha Centauri is the nearest star to the sun. But it isn't one light year away. It isn't two light years away. It's about 4.3 light years away from the sun. And that's the closest star to the sun. So if we multiply the number of, of miles in a light year by the number of light years between the sun and Alpha Centauri, it comes to 26 trillion uh, miles between the sun and Alpha Centauri, the nearest star to the sun. So centaurs in Harry Potter have a very prominent connection to the real world of astronomy. Cygnus Black, the, uh, again, the father of Narcissa, Andromeda, and Bellatrix, another member of the Black family. And uh, being that he's a member of the Black family, um, he's, he, he, he's um, a very notable character. Um, Cygnus is significance in the astronomical world is that Cygnus is a very prominent and bright constellation in the Northern Hemisphere. And if you were to go outside tonight, if it's clear, and looked directly overhead, right above you, around 10 o'clock, between 10 o'clock and 1030, you would see this great big, what looked like a great big cross, almost directly overhead. These stars are fairly bright, marked by the really, really bright bluish star called Deneb. And um, this is a very rich part of the sky in stars. If you don't have binoculars, you'll see a lot of stars there. But if you do have binoculars, scan the area directly overhead tonight around 10 o'clock, you'll be looking right through the constellation of Cygnus and you'll be seeing hundreds and thousands of individual stars all at the same time. It's a gorgeous, beautiful sight. The darker where you're observing from, the darker your location, the more stars you'll see. Okay, so do you wanna ask some questions now? Sure. Um, okay, so one about Voldemort. Let's see. I saw it. Where was it? It's Voldemort. Sorry, I lost it. We have a lot of questions, John. Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> if Voldemort were a celestial body, which one would he be? So I didn't, I didn't understand the question. Could you say it okay. again? If Voldemort were a celestial body, which one would he be? 
<laughs> That's a good question for J.K. Rowling. So, so Voldemort, he's kind of the, 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 the biggest villain in the whole universe, right? So I would say that he would be like a quasar. A quasar, are you ready for this? You asked, so I'm going to give you the answer. A quasar is a black hole, a huge black hole in space that's at the center of a galaxy. And falling into that black hole is gas and dust, maybe even some stars. And when that material falls into the black hole, just before it disappears into the black hole, it's moving through space so fast that it heats up to millions of degrees and is very, very bright, sometimes brighter than the whole galaxy. And it's a very, very, very nasty, energetic, hot, radiation-filled location in the universe. So I would think that Voldemort should be a quasar. Hopefully one that's really far away. Great question, or great answer. Great question, yeah, great question. Um, one other question for right now. Are there any other constellations that Harry Potter characters are named after which you didn't talk about? Oh, yes, there's a lot of them. Um, in fact, I think, do I have any more coming up? Oh, yes, I do. Yeah, there, there, but there's quite a few. Now, I haven't read all of the Harry Potter books or seen all the movies. So I know there's a lot more in, in, in all of the writings. But I do have a couple more that I want to tell you about. Um, and I'm about to show you one of them here. Uh, Draco Malfoy is named after the constellation of Draco the dragon. Now, Draco is a northern constellation. It's very close to the North Star. In this little chart, you see the purple shaded area is the, the region that we identify with Draco. And I have the stick figures here. That's how we help our find our way through the sky. This is the head of the dragon. This is his long neck. This is his, the dragon's body right in through here right in through here all the way till we go right here that's the end of the dragon and you'll see that the dragon extends and slithers between the little dipper right here and the big dipper right here so that's a, a really really big constellation it's it's the eighth largest constellation out of the 88 and it really does look look like a like a snake so you're wondering if there's a wonder if there's a connection between like Slytherin, Slytherin, and Snake, Draco. Maybe that's, maybe, maybe it's a, it's a more important character than we, than we think, right? Because it's given such an important namesake in the sky to be associated with. So yeah, there are other constellations uh, in the, in Harry Potter that I, that I didn't uh, mention for sure. Okay. Uh, you want to take another uh, another question? I'm just afraid that we only have 20 more minutes. All right. And I know you still have a lot to get through. Well, I'll keep going, and then okay. I'll, I'll try to go through it faster than I planned so we can take some of these questions, because I'm sure some of them are really good, like they have been. Great. Thank All you. All right. So I, so I mentioned... <laughs> Pardon me, I mentioned Draco. I have to mention this character, one of my favorite characters, Sirius Black, another member of the of the Black family. But surprisingly, surprisingly, Sirius isn't a Slytherin that like the rest of his family is, right? He's he's from Gryffindor. He's a really different kind of character. And you know, I knew that Sirius, Sirius Black was a powerful character in Harry Potter before I read any of the books, before I looked at any of the movies, I mean. 
because Sirius is the name given to the brightest star in the entire sky. No other star, except the sun, of course, no other star, at least in the night sky, is brighter than Sirius. So it's the brightest star in the sky. It's a, a relatively close neighbor of the sun. It's only about eight and a half light years away. Um, it's a lot hotter than the sun. It's um, a bluish white star because it's so hot. And because Sirius Black in the, in the Harry Potter universe is such an important character, um, and you know he's Harry's godfather, he was James Potter's best friend, you know that he is um, an important character. And that's why I, I think JK associated him with uh, the brightest star in the night sky. Now, speaking of constellations, Speaking of constellations, Sir, uh, Sirius is the not only the brightest star in the night sky, but the brightest star in the constellation called Canis Major. And that's Latin for great or big dog. And I think, personally, Canis Major is one of the constellations that, that looks like its namesake, at least when I'm looking at it. Canis Major is a winter constellation for those of us living in the northern hemisphere. So when you see Orion, you see Canis Major. In fact, this little piece right here, this is part of Orion. So Canis Major is here. It's got a lot of stars in it. Um, and this is Sirius right here. And it is a beacon, a stellar beacon in the southern, uh, low in the southern sky uh, for northern hemisphere winters. And it, it's a really, really bright and interesting star, as is the constellation. So there's, there's, there's a good reason why um, this character has such a prominent name, because he plays so heavily in, in the whole Harry Potter series. All right, so there's one more thing I want to mention. I'm going to cover a little more, a little bit more history. Remember, I told you back at the beginning that there was um, people before the 1500s thought that the Earth was the center of the universe, and we thought that until fr from um, more than 2,000 years ago until about 1500, and then people started to get suspicious. Planets didn't appear to be in the right part of the sky, as the teaching from the old uh, astronomers from the Greeks thought they would be, like Aristotle and Ptolemy. So they knew that we needed a new representation of how the universe really worked. So an, a scientist, a, a Polish astronomer by the name of Nicholas Copernicus, um, who worked in the Catholic Church, had an idea. He said, you know, I don't think it sounds logical for everything in the universe to orbit the Earth. Like, the sun's more important, larger, bigger than the Earth. Why shouldn't things orbit it? So Copernicus, although he's a little bit afraid to mention this, because all the scientists, all the Catholic Church, um, thought that the Earth was the center of everything. But Copernicus's idea was that the sun was the center of everything. So near the end of his life, in fact, um, at the end of his life, in 1543, he wrote a book that stated that the sun, not the earth, was the center of the universe. And that ushered in a new age of astronomy. Early scientists, like this guy Tycho Brahe, who was the greatest astronomer before the invention of the telescope, made very accurate um, records of where the planets were in the sky as they moved through the sky as they orbited the sun. Now I put this picture of, of Uncle Billius here because I think there's a strong resemblance between him and, and Tycho Brahe right here, maybe in his younger years. I don't know. What do you think? John, so, can I just ask a couple of quick questions, I think? Sure. 
Um, quick question from Morgan Ames. Is Sirius bigger than Jupiter? Sirius, so most stars are much, much bigger and much more massive than planets are. So absolutely. Sirius is a star that's about twice as big as the sun. And the sun is 10 times bigger than Jupiter. So Sirius, the star, is much, much larger than Jupiter is. Is there a Canis Minor? Um, there is. And if, let me ask you a question. If Canis Major is the big dog, don't you think Canis Minor should be the little dog? And it is. It's a much smaller constellation. It's right next to Canis Major. And it's a cute little constellation of only a few stars. All right, so I'm going to go through the rest of these slides pretty quickly because I want to get to some questions. So I want you to know that Galileo didn't invent the telescope, but this fellow did, Hans Lipperhe, and he invented it in 1608. But uh, about a year later, Galileo picked up the telescope and started making all of his observations that he's famous for. This is where Galileo was born, in Pisa, Italy. And these are some of the things that Galileo discovered. He was the first to point a telescope toward the sky and write about and teach about what he saw. And one of the things he read about, or what, one of the things he wrote about, was that the Milky Way, this band of white, cloudy, um, milky uh, texture in the sky, when he looked at it with a telescope, he resolved it into hundreds and of thousands of individual stars that you couldn't tell were stars because they were so close together, they all blended together. He also discovered that Venus, the planet, went through phases like the moon did, and that there were blemishes, spots on the sun. And he discovered the four moons of Jupiter that now bear his name, the Galilean satellites. So he did a lot of neat things. So this is where Galileo taught in Padua, Italy. This is, his, this is a, a school, a college that started teaching students in 1222. <laughs> That's a long time ago. This is where Galileo lived. And you know, astronomy is a must take subject for the first five years at, at uh, Hogwarts. And Professor Aurora Sinistra, uh, she takes her classes to meet at midnight at the top of the astronomy tower. And, and the essays for the theory portion of the course involve learning lots of facts. We all know there's lots of facts in astronomy. And uh, as, as, as Ron and Harry's fifth year essay on Jupiter's moon proved for, for, for as an example of those studies that they, they undertook. Right? Just like astronomers today study the moons uh, of Jupiter. Just like the NASA spacecraft, Pioneer, Voyagers, and Galileo flew by these worlds uh, in the past that taught us so much about them. It's an early telescope from Galileo. This is where Galileo lectured. But take a look. This is the astronomy tower in Harry Potter. Galileo loved Venice, he loved Florence. Both had great food, lots of culture, and Galileo loved living and teaching there. So these are my last slides, and I'm gonna, this is Galileo's notebook that he cataloged the positions of Jupiter and all of its moons from January of 1610 until March when he published his first book. Okay, so I'm gonna, leave you with this slide. This is um, astronaut Tracy Caldwell Dyson. And she's in, she's in this picture, she's in the International Space Station in a special room called the cupola. It, 
at the bottom of the space station. And it's where astronauts get to spend a little bit of time while they're up in space and they get to look down upon the earth where there aren't any borders or boundaries between countries that are visible, no differences in politics or religion. Everybody's the same. Everyone who has ever lived, lives down there, some 200 miles below the space station. So the next time you see the International Space Station traveling above you, you never know when there's somebody up there in the cupola, a room with quite a view looking down at the Earth. So whenever I see the ISS, I always wave at it because there's people up there working while we're down here working. Okay, so let's uh, take some of your questions. Okay, John. Um, do planets ever emit light or only reflect it? Do what? S say again? Sorry. Do planets ever emit light or only uh, reflect it? Well, that's going to take another hour, okay? Oh, wow. <laughs> but but you, it's a really, really good question. So the only reason that we see planets is because of the light from the sun that they reflect back to Earth. So they don't give off any light that humans can see. But, but they do give off a kind of light called infrared light. Heat, heat is a form of radiation, just like the light our eyes see. That's all radiation. And our eyes can see visible light that bounces off objects in a room. You can see your computer. You can see the rug or the walls because of, of light that bounces off them and hits your eye. Planets don't give off any light that the eye can see. They all shine by reflected sunlight, but they do give off heat, and that's a form of light. Great question. Heat. Um, how does the Big Dipper stand for anything? Um, well, the Big Dipper is a asterism. It's a, an asterism is a, a portion of a constellation, um, usually represented by a group of moderately or bright stars that makes us think of something. Maybe it's a great square of Pegasus or the summer triangle in the summer sky or the belt of Orion. So the Big Dipper is an asterism, a, a group of stars, a subset of stars, from the larger constellation that's known as Ursa Major. Ursa Major is the Big Bear. So the Big Dipper, we recognize the seven brightest stars in Ursa Major as the Big Dipper. But if you live in England, you recognize those same seven stars as the plow. You know everything, I think. No. Um, <laughs> what is the smallest, closest galaxy? Oh, somebody trying to trip me up. Well, let's see. So I noticed, I noticed on that website that I showed you very, very early in my talk that said the Andromeda galaxy is the closest galaxy. It's really not. It's the closest large galaxy to our own Milky Way. But there are two galaxies that are closer than the Andromeda galaxy. And they're not visible from the Northern Hemisphere, but they're called the Large and Small Magellanic Cloud. You probably heard of the explorer, Ferdinand Magellan, the, the first person to, to sail around the world, at least his mission made it all the way around the world. He died before he got back to the home base. But his, his crews survived and sailed all the way around the world. And when they dipped below the equator, they saw these big fuzzy objects in the sky. Now, even though they didn't discover them because people living in the Southern Hemisphere could see them for ages before they got there, they were the first Northern Hemisphere explorers to dip below the equator so they could see the wonders of the southern hemisphere. And the large and small Magellanic clouds 
got their name from Magell Magellan's mission. Those two galaxies are much, much closer. They're about 200,000 light years from the Milky Way galaxy. And they're the closest ones um, to the Milky Way, much closer than Andromeda. And um, what other galaxies do we know of? Well, we know that the universe contains probably a trillion galaxies, a trillion. That's a thousand billion. Um, that's a lot of galaxies. A lot of them we can see with telescopes. We can see the Andromeda galaxy. We can see the large and small Magellanic clouds without a telescope. But mo all the other galaxies we need a telescope to see. And there are many. If you look up in your, on your computer the Hubble Heritage website, it'll have a tab for beautiful pictures of galaxies that the Hubble Space Telescope taught you. All you have to do is Google Hubble Heritage Images, and you will see some of the most beautiful images of all different kinds of objects. And there's a special tab for galaxies that you can get your fill of all the, they're the most beautiful objects that nature makes, I think. I'm just gonna take a couple more questions. It's now two o'clock and um, people are welcome to stay on and hear the answers to some of um, these questions. We can also, any questions that we don't get to today, we can also see if John can answer and we will send the answers out to the recipient, uh, to the list of attendees. Um, I just want to take a minute now to, to thank everyone for logging in to this webinar today. And I want to take a minute to say thank you to John for his amazing presentation and for sharing all of his knowledge with us. This has been really, really fun. Um, John, I, I, I see this is being recorded. How can I see this again later on? That was the question that was just asked. I wanted to let everybody know that we are recording this full presentation and we will be sending out a follow-up email with the link to the recording as well as the answers to, to John or answers to the questions. Um, John, are the gas giant planets made entirely of gas or is there some solid or liquid in there? Well, yes, kind of. There's a spaceship orbiting Jupiter right now called Juno. And its mission, it's not the first spaceship to go to Jupiter, um, but it's one of its most important missions is to determine if Jupiter, one of the gas giant planets, and the other gas giant planets have small rocky cores deep inside, thousands of miles beneath their cloud tops. We think there are small rocky cores kind of like the seeds that the planets started to form from, but we're not exactly sure. But there are strange things within, um, underneath the cloud layers of some of the gas giants, like, like, like a form of liquid. Um, when, when, when we have enough pressure, we can make a, a liquid into a uh, gas into a liquid, and the pressures deep inside the gas giant planets um, cause gases to be not gases anymore, but, but liquids, and, and maybe even solids deep, deep inside near the core. But we don't know the character of that yet. We're still trying to find that out. There are still a lot of things about our own planets in our own solar system that we don't know, and that's one of Ju Juno's big, big objectives and goals, is to figure that out. I have one more question for you, I think is a really great question to end on. And then hopefully we could get answers to some of the other questions to email out to the attendees. Um, the last question is, why is it important to study space? I love that question. Yeah. Um, it's important to study space because what happens out in space affects us here. Things that go on in space do affect people and live 
living things on planet Earth. Some of them are harmless and beautiful, but some of, this, some of them can be dangerous. And the more we know about them, how they work, why they happen, the better we'll be able to be able to protect ourselves and invent things, techniques that can protect us from some of the things that are dangerous. Space is um, kind of a dangerous place to make a living, right? It's not evil. It's hot, cold, lots of radiation. There are explosions. And if you're near those explosions, they can hurt you. So the universe isn't out to get us. It's not evil. But just like running into a, a, a bad storm or a, a, like a hurricane on Earth, things that you don't understand or don't know about can hurt you. And the more we know about how the universe works, the better we'll be. The better the, better the universe, the better we understand the universe, the better our chances of living long lives and keeping the earth clean and safe for all of the people who come after us. That's the best reason that I can think of to study space. Thank you for your expertise with us today, John. You I certainly learned many new things. I'm sure everybody else did as well. It was my, um, pleasure. It was my pleasure, and I thank everyone for, for coming to the talk and sending in such unbelievably good questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Take care, everyone.